All right, today I'm teaching on a topic that most, uh, probably maybe you've never heard of before, but I think it's something important for us to learn. Um, that there are passages in the Bible, like a lot of people think, um, you know, the only chance to be saved is only lost when you die. But when we read the Bible, there are actually other ways people can lose their last chance to be saved. And I'm going to go through some of those today. And I think what's, what's good about it is sometimes it teaches us that, you know, people can't just keep delaying salvation because sometimes in the Bible that you can, you can obviously lose your last chance. We don't know when that is for each individual, but the Bible does allude to that. And also I think it'll give us a good understanding because sometimes these passages are used to sort of reject um, eternal security, once saved, always saved. And when you understand that these passages are talking about unsaved people, you know, losing their opportunity to ever be saved, it puts it in the right context. So the reason why we're at Jeremiah 6, the title of the sermon is Reprobate and Beyond Salvation. Right? Reprobate and Beyond Salvation. Okay, so we get the title of the sermon from Jeremiah 6, where we get the definition of reprobate. What does a reprobate mean? Jeremiah 6 says, Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. So a reprobate is somebody that has been rejected by the Lord. They've lost their opportunity to ever be saved. And you, you, when we read through Jeremiah, I was talking about the wickedness, and it likened to like, you know, trying to purify some metal, and it's just not possible to be purified, right? It's kind of like the people you think about hell is kind of the same. It's like they're burning forever, but they can no, no longer be purified. It's uh, rejected, right? So in this sermon, <coughs> I want you to see that in the Bible, you know, a lot of people believe that only, like I said, only death it brings a finality of judgment for the unbeliever. But that is not the case, right? Some people lose their opportunity to be saved even prior to death. And we're going to talk about the ways that the Bible alludes to where people can become uh, what we would call a, rep a reprobate. So the first one is, this is the obvious one, right? This is what everyone knows. Is number one is, if you die without Jesus Christ, obviously if you die without Jesus Christ, you become reprobate, meaning you go to hell um, because of the sins that you've not been forgiven for, you pay that punishment, and there's no way out of hell, right? So we know that there's, there's only two, two uh, destinations to go. There's no second chance if somebody dies without Jesus Christ. There's not like a, this concept of purgatory that if you weren't good enough, you kind of go second chance, and then you're purified, and then you get to go to heaven anyway. There is no second chances after death. We see in, and I don't have this in my notes, but we see in the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke, where you have the beggar and the rich man, and the two options were the, the beggar was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, he went to heaven, but the rich man opened his eyes and he was in hell. There wasn't a second chance. There wasn't like a, you know, when people think, oh, you know, well, when I, when I meet the big guy upstairs, we'll have a chat and we'll, you know, we'll sort it out. No, you don't get that opportunity because you're already condemned when you open your eyes after you die, you're burning in hell, right? Because you're already condemned. It's not that you, you die and, and then there's a judgment. The people that come out of hell in Revelation, they're already judged. They're just being relocated to the lake of fire because there's another judgment for saved people which is according to our works, but our sin is no longer there. It's about whether we're going to get rewarded or not. So there's different reasons for that, um, that white throne judgment as well. There's, there's rewards doled out and there's also punishment, but those that are not saved just get relocated to the lake of fire. They come out, they're guilty, they, they get relocated. So we see this split between the two, the two destinations in Matthew 25 too. And this is a passage that's often used to promote <coughs> work salvation. Um, but we see here the divide, that there isn't a middle ground, it's only heaven or hell. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. <coughs> then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. Right, so this is talking about the white throne judgment. He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. You see how there's only two groups? Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him. So you notice that he's divided them into what? Righteous and unrighteous. Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw, thee, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in and naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, 
and as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. So the lesson that we're getting as well from here is that, you know, when we talk about serving Jesus, you know, there's this idea in the Bible that you can't love Jesus and not love your brother. You know, that's why, like, you can't say I love Jesus, I don't love his word. We already talked about that. But, you know, you can't love Jesus and not love church. You know, like, if, you're, if your mentality is, like, well, I love Jesus, but I just, just despise coming to church. I don't want to see, I don't want to see people's faces. I don't even get along with them. It's like, well, then you don't love God, do you? Because when you love Jesus, you're going to love his body, right? So the you know, practical way for you to know how much do I love Jesus is how much do I read his word? Or how much do I love the word? Another way you measure how much do I love Jesus or how much do I love Jesus' body, his people? You, know, you don't love, you can't say you love Jesus, you know, it's all this emotional, but then when it comes to actually practically loving him, you don't love him in any of the ways that he demands that you love him. So that, that's one of the lessons here, that's a bit of a tangent. And he says here, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you curse it into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So this is the two groups, righteous and unrighteous. For I was unhungered and you gave me no meat, I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you took me not in. Naked and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, a thirst, or a stranger, or a naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. And these shall go into everlasting, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but righteous into life eternal. You say, Victor, is he splitting them into righteous and unrighteous? Does that teaching work salvation? Well, if, if it was possible to be righteous by your works, so you see how there's the old covenant being alluded to here because he's teaching in, in Matthew, which is he's still in Old Testament times, this idea that righteous gets you to heaven, unrighteous gets you to hell. So that's a, that's a truth. But what's also true is it's not possible to be righteous by your own righteousness. Right? Our own righteousness are as filthy rags. So how do we actually get into the group of the righteous? Well, the new covenant is we become righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 10, you know, we, we're not righteous by our own works. We submit ourselves to the righteousness of Christ, which is by faith, right? So this is why you know, people will use these passages to teach work salvation, right? And you're right, it's alluding, it's alluding to a work salvation. But what you have to understand when you understand the whole Bible is work salvation is not possible, right? So what is actually being taught here? How do we get into this righteous group? Well, you can't ignore the whole teaching of the New Testament, which is we're righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. So that's what puts us in this group, right? The righteousness of Christ is imputed unto us. So you have to understand these passages well, because people will use these to teach work salvation. And every time somebody uses, and I'm getting on a bit of tangent here, but anytime people use a passage like this to teach work salvation, you just got to ask yourself, well, if that's truly teaching how to get to heaven, then what group are we in? We're definitely not in the group on the right, I'll tell you that. So it's like, what, what hope does that give me? If you're going to be teaching this is work salvation, that doesn't help any of us. It puts all of us into the left group, you know? So the hope of salvation, and the hope of salvation by grace, we can get into that group of sheep on the right through Jesus Christ, right? And this is why God looks at us. You know, the teaching here is when God looks at the sheep on the right, he sees righteous people, even though we're filthy sinners, because we have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, right? He sees Jesus, doesn't see us. Uh, and our sin. But the point I'm going to this thing is, when we're talking about reprobates, why you're a reprobate when you're in hell? Because it's everlasting. See, see, hell is not a very long period of time. Hell is forever, because you are reprobate. You are rejected of God. And, you know, the thing is, the, the funny thing about hell, well, not the funny thing, but the, the interesting things about hell is like, one is, you know, it, it reveals to us how much God hates sin. You know, it reveals, you know, God's nature and how much he hates sin because we, we think our sin's not that, that big a deal. We learn about hell. It's like hell is a big deal. But the thing is that, you know, in order to get saved, we have to put our hope in something. And I feel like that hell being everlasting, I feel like one of the reasons why it might be like that is because it actually removes hope itself. You know, like you don't even, you can't hope in anything anymore, the fact that it's everlasting. So it's like the thing that would have got you saved now no longer is even available in hell. Um, that's, that's something I always think about. <laughs> so it's everlasting, you reprobate. Uh, Daniel 12 sort of alludes to this uh, <coughs> resurrection to the two, the sheep and the goats, the, you know, resurrection to life. Some go into everlasting punishment, some go into righteous into life eternal. Daniel 12 too says here, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt, right? 
you're reprobate if you die without Jesus Christ. Uh, Revelation 19.20, we see here, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that, was, that wrought miracles before him, um, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So I'm just showing you here that the beast is a man. Right? The beast is not Satan. The beast is a, a man that you know, some people believe might be uh, you know, possessed by Satan, but you know, I don't think it's Satan. It's just a man that's doing Satan's will. And then the false prophet was a man as well. Remember, he's pretending to be John the Baptist. So these are two men. And the point I'm trying to show you here is in Revelation 19, 20, these two men are cast into the lake of fire. Right? So... I'm not preaching about hell, but I'll just say it's like they're in hell, but it's, technically it's two locations right now, but one day they'll, they'll be united. Hell will be cast into the lake of fire, and, and it's relocated to the lake of fire. So these guys are in the lake of fire, which is still called hell, and they're men in Revelation 19, 20. The point I'm trying to show you here is a thousand years later in Revelation 20, when the thousand years are expired, so this is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, called the millennium thousand years, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So it's like Satan is also in hell as well, being punished for the thousand years. After the thousand years, Satan comes out to deceive the nations again, shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So, right, so then Satan is now cast into the lake of fire. He was bound in hell for a thousand years. Now he's cast where the beast, look, it says here, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So notice that when the beast and the false prophet were cast into the lake of fire, we don't believe this, um, gosh, what is it called? What's, what's the doctrine called again? Dis destruction? Annihilation. Thank you. Annihilation, right? So annihilation, we don't believe in annihilation where people cast into the lake of fire and they just cease to exist, right? Because what? The beast and the false prophet were cast into the lake of fire. But a thousand years later, when Satan is cast into the lake of fire, who's still there? The beast and the false prophet, right? So this is how we know, like hell is eternal. It, it, uh, you know, we don't know how it works mechanically or physically, but somehow we're burning in hell. Like people are burning in hell. They're not being consumed. They can feel it, but they're not being burnt up Right? And it's a, it's a terrible place. That's what people need to be saved from. You know, there's, no, there's no getting around it. People say, well, hell is a terrible place. You're right. Uh, we shouldn't tell, but we shouldn't have the thought that hell is unfair. You know, God is a just God. He's a perfect God. What it should tell us is, man, we don't realize how bad our sin is. This is how bad our sin is, that this place exists. Right? And people deserve this punishment, and they need to be saved from it by believing on Jesus Christ. So if somebody dies without Jesus Christ, like I said, it's like the reprobate silver, right? It's, they're rejected. It's, they can't be purified anymore. They are burning in hell for all eternity. So that's one way to become reprobate. But there are four other ways in the Bible to become reprobate that, that can happen prior to salvation. And we'll talk about those, each one of those. Number two is you hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, we don't always know when people pass these points. It's a bit like the age of accountability, right? Like, do, you, do we know exactly what age it is where a child goes from being accountable for their sins and when, from not accountable for their sins? We don't know the exact point, right? And, and, and that's something I'm willing to admit. We don't know where that exact point when somebody crosses the line. But what I'm teaching you here is not that we know when somebody's crossed the line and we can know definitively and say that person has crossed the line. What I'm teaching you here today is that, that it is possible to cross a line, right? Because some people think the only line you cross is if you die without Jesus Christ. And, and the point I'm making today is, no, there, there can be a line prior to that where it's like, you know what? That's it for you. You know, if you don't believe on Jesus Christ, there are ways where it's like God says you're rejected, right? You no longer have that chance. And, and we can see in a passage like this some evidence Right of what happens to somebody when they're given over. This is what happens. So hold the truth in our right. Where do we get this? In Romans 1, there's a big passage about people that are given over to a reprobate mind. Right, And we see some of the things that they do. So we'll read through it. I'll explain it to you, what I think is going on here. <coughs> now, <coughs> let's read through it first and I'll give you some thoughts. Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So the passage starts by saying, 
the, the wrath of God against people that hold the truth in unrighteousness. This is what I'm talking about here. So there's a couple of things here. We're going to see in this passage people holding the truth. They know the truth but they're holding it in unrighteousness. And we get an idea of what is the unrighteousness that is being done in this passage that, that, is, that, is, that they're, they're holding the truth, but they're doing this unrighteousness. And then how has God revealed his wrath against these people? Right? So that's what it's saying in Romans 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Right? So the, the, the passage here, the, 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 what's being explained here is that there are people that know the truth. Right? So these are not just ungodly people that are ignorant. These are people that know the truth of Jesus Christ and God's judgment, the Bible. They don't care and they live a very promiscuous fornication, you know, homosexual. You've got all sorts of things in here, right? That sort of life. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. So this is alluding to creation, saying, look, these guys, they know that there's a God, right? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So they have no reason to doubt that there's a creator. But verse 21, because that when they knew God, so they, kn they acknowledged that there, was a, that there was a God, they just didn't want to accept him. It's like, it's like the, the Jews, they said, well, they will not have this man to reign over us, even though they acknowledge that he had this power. They just didn't want to submit to the true God. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So we see here that <clears throat> they are not accepting the true God, and now they're trying to turn God into something that they want, right? So they're rejecting true God. It's like idolatry, creating their own God, their own vain imaginations. And I believe this foolish heart is darkened is alluding to God actually darkening that heart, hardening that heart, giving them that reprobate mind that we'll see later on. So what I don't believe about Romans 1, I don't believe Romans 1 is teaching a progression. Like some people say, this is a progression that we're rereading. And they go from this step to the next step to the next step, and they descend into this reprobate mind. What I think is saying, this is, I believe is being taught in Romans 1, it's just repeating the same thing multiple times. The fact that they knew the truth, they rejected the truth, they want to live in unrighteousness, and God responded, right? What did he respond with? He darkened their heart, they knew God, they glorified him not as God, they, they made up their own gods, right? And, and, and we know from the rest of the passage that they are also living in unrighteousness and from prior, and God darkens their heart. That's what I think that's saying. And then it continues, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So this is just, it's not a progression, this is just repeating again, that these people whose foolish heart was darkened, they're professing themselves to be wise. They became fools in their, you know, their foolish heart, vain imaginations, changed to how else are they glorifying not, him not as God and became vain in their imagination. They changed the glory of the corrupt, uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So they, they prefer to worship animals and worship the earth rather than the God that created the earth. Wherefore, so you see how it's the same thing. So it's repeating again what they did and then he's saying because of this, this is what God does, right? When they hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now when do they cross this line? We don't really know. But this is how God responds. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So now we know when the Bible says hold the truth in unrighteousness, there's a, it's, there's a specific context of unrighteousness here. It's like se sexual promiscuity is going on, right? And, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, God giving them over is when they commit these things. I actually believe that they're already committing these things to a certain degree, right? It's through the lust of their own heart. The lust of their hearts, they're already dishonoring, dishonoring their body between themselves, but I think then God completely gives them over to it, right? So that's what they're doing. They're dishonoring their own body between themselves. And we get a bit more graphic as the chapter goes on, what sort of they, they, this dishonoring they're doing between each other. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. So you see how it's not a progression, it's just repeating the same thing, but it's just tackling different ways that they do it, right? They glorified him not as God, then it says they worshipped the creature more than the creator, and then it, now before it was, um, you know, they turned the image, corruptible God into an image made like a corruptible beast. So you see how they know the truth, but they don't want it. it it's idolatry. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. 
Amen. <coughs> For this cause. So again, it's holding the truth, the idolatry, but living this unrighteous life. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. So I don't believe it's that they then did these that he gave them up. I think they were already doing these things to a certain extent, but then they, it's like, it's like what God does in this passage, it's like the, how he reveals his wrath. It's like there's a natural limiter on people's wickedness when it comes to fornication and what they're willing to do. And then God's wrath on them is like he just removes that limiter. It's like then just, it's, there's no limit anymore. It's like for God, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women, they changed the natural use. So I think this is what they were, I believe now about this passage, like this is what they were already doing to some extent. Right? So there was homosexuality, fornication, there's things going on to it, like, but like to a limited extent. Because I don't believe homos homosexuality is like an unforgivable sin or anything. Like if people commit homosexuality, you can still be saved. But what I think is being taught in Romans 1 now is that it, it, it's happening to a certain extent. This is what they're doing. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burn in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meek. So it's not only in the Old Testament that homosexuality is condemned. And it's condemned alongside adultery, fornication, bestiality. These are, you know, sins of fornication outside of marriage. Right? Marriage is one man, one woman for life. So it's describing that they, they, they are living this fornication life, but holding the truth in unrighteousness. Right? So it's not just people that are unrighteous. It's that they, these people, they know the truth. They don't want it. And they live this life. And even as they did not like to retain God in their lives. So you remember we talked about the things that they do that hold the truth in unrighteousness. So it's giving us ways that they do that. And now God, this is part of God's response, right? He's, he gives them over to vile affections. He darkens their heart. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So it's like they don't want, they know God, but they don't want to retain God in their knowledge. So God gives them over to reprobate minds, saying, okay, you will never have God in your knowledge right? God, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And this is how he reveals his wrath. See, look at this verse, first few words, verse 29. Being filled with. This is why I think like God just removes the limiter. Because I think there's a natural limit to how wicked somebody can get or how disgusting they can get in their promiscuity, right? But then sometimes you see like you see evidence today where it's just beyond disgusting, right? And why I think, you know, we, we can't really know if somebody's crossed the line. We have some good evidence that if they're like, you know, some, sometimes these really, you know, filthy, you know, things that they do and they promote and they want to do at the Mardi Gras and all that sort of stuff, right? It's like he just removes that limiter and, and I think that's why they become like that. They become almost like animals in their desire, insatiable desire for sexual gratification. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, so it's not just that, these are obviously sins that can be committed by believers, but what I, what, I, what, I, what I believe about this passage and why it's in this context of Romans 1 is because it's not that they're just doing these things, but it's like he, they, the wrath of God on them is out now that they're filled with it. You know, making that point. Covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. I won't go through all what all these words mean. Who knowing, look, see here? Remember holding the truth in our right? Who knowing the judgment of God. That means they know that the punishment for sin is hell. Right? So you see how they know the truth? Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. The wages of sin is death. Not only do the same, but look at this, but have pleasure in them that do them. So they like getting other people to do that too. You know, that's why you sometimes wonder. You know, the Bible's almost describing this predatory type of lifestyle that you see amongst, you know, the homosexual community where they're trying to like, you know, I'm not saying all of them are like this, but some of them are like this, where they like prey on the pure. They prey on the young, you know, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. Why? This is, this is a good sign that maybe they're reprobate. Now, do we know for sure? We don't. So what, what I don't agree with now is, and I don't agree that we can identify who these reprobates are. But you know what? What I think this passage teaches us is, I don't think we need to identify who they are. Why? Because the reprobates in this passage, what does it say? 
It says, it says here, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. I don't think we need to know who they are because, you know, the people that are reprobates, I believe in this passage, they don't want anything to do with us. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like they wouldn't want to talk about God. They don't even want to retain God in their knowledge. So I just feel like we don't have to try and pinpoint who these people are because, you know, if somebody wants to listen to you about the gospel, you give them the gospel, right? If they don't, are they reprobate? Who knows? But what I do know for sure is that a true reprobate won't want anything to do with us, right? Now, can, can reprobates try and sneak into churches? Maybe they can, maybe they do try. But you know what? They won't try and sneak into a church like this because where are they going to hide? Where do they sneak into church? They sneak into churches where the doctrine's like kind of wishy-washy and they just let anyone, you know, somebody walks into the church, hey, you want to like manage the creche on your own with the door locked? You know, like those sort of churches are the ones that they sneak into. Our church, they won't, right? There's too much light in this church. There's too much heat in this church. Leaven doesn't exist too long in this church. So that's how I believe we should understand Romans 1. I'll just see if I've covered all my notes here. Romans 1. So number two is they hold the truth and unrighteousness. So you can see that the wrath of God <coughs> revealed is a reprobate mind that cannot retain God in its knowledge and being given over to these vile affections, right? And we could see a picture of these, this is rampant fornication, homosexuality, just insatiable desire for sexual gratification and just things that are not normal to people, right? It's just like, it's not, it's not in that bell curve, right? It's like all the way to the extreme of the, of the bell curve of, you know, what people would find normal in terms of uh, sexual gratification. And the other thing is they know that their actions deserve this punishment. If they do it anyway, like I said, and they have, and what's even more wicked, they have pleasure in them that do them. So they find pleasure in seeing people do these things that know that God hates, right? All right, let's go on to another one. So one is you die without Christ. Number two, you hold the truth in unrighteousness. So now we're covering some ones where it's like, how do you become reprobate prior to salvation, right? It's, po it's possible. Number three is corrupting revelation. Corrupting revelation. Now, where do I get this from? Revelation 22, 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these plagues, uh, add, unto, add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, there are different views on this passage and... Sort of, the, sort of where I'm sitting right now is I believe that this passage is only referring to the book of Revelation. But I just feel like it'd be hard to, I mean, if, if John is writing a book and he's saying you take away from the words of this book that he would be referring to the other 65 books of the Bible. But some people use this passage to say if you tamper with any of God's word, you'd lose your part out of the book of life. Um, I feel like that might, might be stretching it. it. It's possible that that's the case. But I feel like, you know, it's, it's most clear that he's referring to this book, like the book of Revelation. So maybe the book of Revelation has a special place that if you tamper with this book of Revelation, that makes you reprobate. Like that's like something that you actually remove your part out of the, lake of, uh, out of the book of life. So how do you commit this sin? Right, like what, 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 do, you, what do I think this sin is? I, I don't think it's simply somebody... Uh, preaching a false doctrine because some people will try and use this you know they'll, they'll use this passage and say okay well you can't tamper with God's word if you tamper with God's word that's like you remove your part out of the you know you're, you're, you're adding to your plagues or you're removing your part out of the book of life and they'll say like oh it's like when you preach the, you're preaching God's word and you know maybe you, have, you they believe you have a false doctrine or you're changing God's word blah 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 they say like oh you know careful because that's like you know Revelation 22 I don't believe that's the case. I don't believe it's just a case of preaching something false, right? Because any, anyone can believe false things, right? Like when we look at the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, I won't read the whole thing, but we can see here that heresies is a work of the flesh. So it is possible for believers to believe wrong things, have heresies, and obviously even teach them. That doesn't mean they're not saved. It just means they believe something wrong. Um, so I don't think that's the case. What, what I believe it is, because, you know, if you think about how God's word is distributed, it is sort of like, written down and published as though this is God's word. So what, what I believe the sin would be is it would be like if you published a, a copy of Revelation and you removed things from it and you tried to palm it off as though it was legitimately God's word. Like that's how I think you would practically break this sin, right? And what it is, it's like you're pretending 
that this book of Revelation is the true book of Revelation and yet you've tampered with it, right? And, and try to remove words or add words to it. And I think that's the warning we're given in Revelation 22. So now, how, how is it reprobate? Because your part is taken out of the book of life. Now, what I just want to cover here on this point is just to give you a brief summary of how the book of life works. Because people say, well, wait a second, if somebody breaks this sin, uh, does this sin, and they're not saved, and their part is removed out of the book of life, the question is, well, how, how did their name even get into the book of life? Because don't you need to be saved for your name to get written into the book of life? And if their part is taken out, is this teaching that you're losing your salvation? So what I want to undo the misconception is, is that people have different ideas how the book of life works. Some people think when you get saved, your name is then written into the book of life. I believe everybody's name starts in the book of life. And when you become reprobate, your name is blotted out of the book of life. So this is why I think like these people's names are in the book of life, meaning that it doesn't mean they're necessarily saved. It just means they're not reprobate yet, right? Because remember, when you go to hell, your name's blotted out of the book of life because now you're reprobate. But your name can be blotted out of the book of life prior to going to hell. There's other ways to get your name out of the book of life. This is one of them, right? One of the ways to get your name blotted out of the book of life is you tamper with the book of Revelation. So don't think this is teaching losing your salvation. This is them removing, they're becoming reprobate by their part being taken out of the book of life. So now why do I think the book of life works that way? Because we, we learn about the book of life, like Philippians 4.3, I entreat the also true yoke fellow, help those women which, which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So we, we learn about people whose names are in the book of life, but it's not whose names were written in the book of life. It's just they are in there, right? Revelation 3. <coughs> but what we do read about in the Bible, <coughs> we read about people's names being blotted out of the book of life. He that overcometh, the same will be clothed in white, white raiment. I, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. So notice he's not saying they overcome and I will write their name in the book of life, which is how most people think the book of life works. And I don't believe it works that way. This also ties into the fact that children are born spiritually alive. I know this is a different topic. And, and when they die, that's why they go to heaven, right? Because they're not accountable for their sins yet. They're not spiritually dead. They're spiritually alive. And that also goes to show that they would be in the book of life, right? Because they're in the book of life. They're spiritually alive still, right? Then they die. They're in the book of life. They can go to heaven. So he says, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. So this is not a promise that you... you this is not saying anything about how you get your name in the book of life. This is just saying the promise is your name won't be blotted out. People just assume that when you get saved, your name's put in the book, and he's promising that you'll never lose your salvation. But we know you can't lose your salvation, so some people think that this is a passage that teaches you can lose your salvation, because they say, well, why would he say I won't blot your name out if it's not possible to ever blot your name out? And that's why I think it works the other way, right? It works that you're already in there, you become reprobate when your name is blotted out. But if you get saved, he's saying your name will never get blotted out. I will not blot your name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. How do we overcome? He, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So we overcome not by our works, like in Matthew 25, right? We overcome by our faith. Our faith is what makes us righteous. We overcome the world through our faith. That's how we get the promise that our name will not be blotted out of the book of life, right? Same in Revelation 20. Revelation 20 alludes to the book of life. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So again, you'll see that there's no, there's no allusion here to people being written into the book of life. It's just they look into the book of life and they see who's left. It's like, they see this person, oh, your name's not in there because it was blotted out. You're reparate, you're cast into the lake of fire. Right? So what I'm saying is there's two ways the book could work. I think it works that way. I think that lines up more with scripture. I know it's not what's commonly taught, but I think it, it works a lot better. I think it's a much more sound position. So corrupting revelation is another way to be repro become reprobate, go beyond salvation. Right? And like I said, we talked about how I think that works and how your name, your part is removed from the book of life. Number four, <coughs> uh, 
Number four is hardening your heart. Hardening your heart. Now this one is similar to Romans 1, where Romans 1 was you hold the truth in unrighteousness. Um, this one is similar in the sense that people know the truth, but it's like they, they, you only get so many chances to reject it. This is how I think this works. Hebrews 6, verse 1. Le Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So these are some of the fundamentals of the faith. Of the doctrine of baptism, laying out of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. So you see that there is something that God can do that will make you not be able to, right? If not, God will not allow. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. And if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified of themselves the Son of God afresh and put into an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. Um, well, I think I've missed the last verse. Because the, the other verse says, but that which bringeth forth thorns and briars is rejected is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So I, I missed that verse in that passage. But how it all ties together is because this is talking about people becoming reprobate and how the analogy of the rain bringing forth herbs or bringing forth thorns and briars is that, you know, God sends his rain on all of them. But some people, they reject the truth and they become a thorn or a briar and they get rejected. So what is this talking about here? Because some people use this passage in Hebrews 6 to teach that you can lose your salvation. Now obviously we don't believe you can lose your salvation because if you could lose your salvation then there's whole other passages that you know, would completely contradict that position. So what's the right understanding of this passage? I believe what this passage is teaching is some people get all the chances in the world to get saved. To the point where, I mean, think about in the early church where people are seeing miracles, they would know people, they got healed. They might have seen some of Jesus' miracles. They still didn't believe him, right? So they didn't accept, they didn't eat the bread, if that makes sense. They didn't eat the spiritual bread and drink the spiritual wine to get them saved and accept Jesus Christ. But they tasted of the heavenly gift, right? They were so close to it, right? Meaning, you know, people can know the truth and it's like sometimes they just know it, and they have, but their heart is hardening heart. And I, had, I, I, I don't know if this happened to my, my, one of my friends uh, when I was younger, but I always think of him when I think of this passage because, you know, it's like he went along to the youth camps. He understood the Bible. Like he understood, like we were talking about, he knew exactly what salvation meant, what it implied, that if you believed on Jesus Christ, you'd be saved forever and everything like that. And it's like he was there, and then one day it was just like, nah, he rejected it. And he went the total opposite direction now it's like he's like you know, against it and arguing against it, you know what i mean like so it was like that's that's what i think this passage is describing it's like people get so close they reject it they reject it they reject it and then there's a final rejection and then it's like that's it that's it for them right and it's like it's impossible to renew them again to repentance it's like that that they get to a point where they will now no longer ever turn from their dead works or turn from their false beliefs and believe on jesus christ and that's, the, the, that's what I'm saying. So, so what, I'm, what I'm, I guess, teaching you in this sermon is, you know, it, it's not only death, you know, because people can have the opportunity to be saved, to be saved, be saved, and eventually God says, that's enough. And that can happen before somebody dies, right? So it's similar to Romans 1, right? But it's just a hardening of the heart. It's a constant rejection of the truth as opposed to giving somebody over to uncleanness is just saying they no longer now can put their faith on Jesus Christ, and uh, like I said, it reminds me of that my my friend in high school. You know, they were doing all those things, uh, not necessarily given over under cleanness, but their heart now is just so hard to the things of God. You know, and I think this is what this passage is describing. Okay, let's do one more. So that's hardening of the heart, just showing that that can happen prior to salvation. It is it is possible. Like I said, we don't know. When people cross these lines. So I'm not teaching this sermon to go, ah, you know, that person's reprobate, I'm not even bother trying. I think true people that are reprobate, they won't want anything to do with it. It's like, you know, and it's just unfortunate. <clears throat> Number five, 
And the last one, blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. So this is one everyone's heard of, blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. So let's look at that one quickly. Luke 12, 10. Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Let's look at it in Matthew 12 as well. It says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. For, and whosoever, shall, shall, uh, whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh a word against the, speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Look at this. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So you see that? This is, this is often known as the unforgivable sin, right? The um, blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Now, what is blasphemy of the Holy Ghost? Now, a lot of people have different ideas on what it is too. I'll give you my opinion on what I think it is based on this next passage, right? What is actually blasphemy of the Holy Ghost? It says here in Mark 3, this is the passage in Mark 3 of the same situation. The scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub. What's that? That's like a satanic spirit, right? They believe it's the devil. And by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. So he's saying, you know, Satan's not going to go against himself. <coughs> if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand. It hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost shall never, hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because, look at this, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. So this is the hint, I think, that tells us what blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is. Right? What is it? I think it's when somebody truly believes that the Spirit of God is evil, is satanic. Right? That's sort of what they're doing. They're seeing the Spirit of God and they believe that the Spirit of God would be like somebody saying, like maybe a practical way today would be like somebody believing the Bible is actually an evil book. Do you know what I mean? Like, and you know, they get to that point where they just think it's evil. Like I said, I don't know when people cross this point, and this is just my opinion, but I, I would say it's something like that where they say that's actually a, like Satan origin book. You know, it's a satanic book, but it's the Word of God. You know, I think when somebody gets to that point, that's like, you know, that's it for them. They can't, they can't be saved. Uh, I don't know when people get to that point. Now, I don't think it is. Because do you remember, like, there was, you know, like back, it was prior to TikTok days and everything, but I'm sure something like this will trend again one day. But do you guys remember on, online people were doing the, blas the, whole, the blasphemy challenge? You know, and there was all these kids saying, oh, you know, I blaspheme the Holy Ghost and I'm not afraid. And it was like, oh, I challenge you to do this Holy Ghost challenge, you know. Now, are they reprobate? Maybe some of them are, I don't know. But I don't think that's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. That's just kids doing silly things to just rebel and they think, oh, I'm going to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. I think there's a difference between somebody just saying, I'm blaspheming the Holy Ghost and somebody actually believing the Spirit of God is satanic, right? So... That's, that's how I understand this blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And if somebody gets to that point, the Bible's saying, well, you'll never have forgiveness, neither in this world nor in the world to come. So one question to think about, and, and, and we talk, uh, that's why I think it's important to understand how these doctrines work, is because people will say things like, well, can a believer commit this sin? Now, we believe in eternal security. We believe that when a person believes on Jesus Christ, all their sins are forgiven, right? So we don't undo all these fundamental doctrines to try and fit our misunderstanding of how these work. So how do we logically and soundly fit these sort of teachings into that framework, right? Well, it's the, the logical conclusion would be, well, that believers will not commit this sin. If somebody has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, they don't do these things. You can't come, become reprobate if you're a believer on Jesus Christ. Because think about it. If, if you believe on Jesus Christ today, and that means all your sins that Jesus died for on the cross have been forgiven, well, then logically, the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Ghost does not exist in that set of sins that you will ever commit, right? Because that means you couldn't be saved now, right? Because there's a sin that hasn't been paid for for you. So that's why I think the way it works is if somebody puts their faith on Jesus Christ, that's proof positive that they will never do these things in their life. 
you know, because you can't, because all your sins are forgiven. So it's, 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 that's how I think it should be uh, logically is. So I don't think a believer who believes the Word of God is filled with the Word of God, where we think that the Word of God is satanic, right? And they call it an unclean spirit. So I just think it's saying whatever believer commits these things is like an illogical statement because it would be like saying, I, I try to use the analogy, it's like saying whatever triangle has a fourth side. It's like, well, it doesn't make sense because the triangle has three sides. It's like a believer doesn't have these sins, right? So that's, that's how I would uh, sort of answer those. So now some people believe <coughs> that this sin of blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is just the same as number one, just dying without Jesus Christ. And they just kind of say, well, you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost, you didn't believe on Jesus Christ, and that's the same as blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. I think they're two different things because remember in Matthew 7, we see these people, it says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall I enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So these are people, they're not, they're not blaspheming the Holy Ghost. They don't think Jesus is evil, right? They, they just didn't trust him for their salvation. They were just trusting their own righteousness, the things they were trying to do for God. So I don't believe that blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is equated with just rejecting Christ as your Savior and trusting dead works, right? Because you see here, people trying to do the right thing, trusting dead works, and they're not saved. But they're not necessarily blaspheming the Holy Ghost, like we saw the Pharisees doing, where they say, he hath an unclean spirit. They're not going to say that to Jesus. They believe the Spirit of God is the right Spirit. They're just not trusting salvation, trusting, trusting Jesus for salvation. Now, a bonus, bonus point. You'll say, ah, isn't this somebody, the way somebody becomes reprobate? Because you say, why did they take the mark of the beast? Now, I'll tell you why I think it's a, a bonus point and not something that people do. Because look at what it says here in Revelation 13. It says here, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the number of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him count, let him have understanding, count the number of the beast, for as a number of a man. And his number is 603, 4 and 6. So that's where we get 666 from. And everyone's saying now, like, this is 666. If you don't, don't say to somebody, like, hey, that's okay, that's fine. It's like, ah, yeah, satanic. Um, but I've seen that before. Now, do they use that as a symbol of satanic? Probably they do, right? There's a lot of things that are maybe common. You know, do they use circles? Do they use triangles? Probably do. That doesn't mean that that's wrong in and of itself, right? But I've heard, I've heard that before. You know, 666 is this thing. But that's where we get the number 666. What I'm showing you here in this passage is that we have this mark of the beast, right? And we know that those that receive the mark of the beast will go to hell. But what I want to tell you about the mark of the beast here in, um, earlier on in the chapter is remember you have to worship the beast to get the mark of the beast. Who's going to worship the beast? Look at this. They worship the dragon <coughs> who gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in, earth, in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Look at this. See? whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. So I'm including this as a bonus point as not as an actual point because I, I don't believe the way it works. Like technically, it's not that you lose your salvation. You lose your chance to ever be saved when you take the mark of the beast. The way it technically works is only those that are reprobate will take the mark of the beast. Right? So it's those that are not written in the book of life take the mark of the beast. Right? So if somebody becomes reprobate, whether it's any of the other ways we talked about, they're the ones that... That's why the Bible talks about like believers will not be deceived. Right? Because once you're saved, you know, your name cannot be blotted out of the book of life. You, you won't be deceived into taking the mark of the beast. So it's just something that believers don't do. So it's just 
you know, it's just a bit of a technical point, right? Revelation 17, 8 says the same thing. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Okay, so it's not really that taking the mark makes you reprobate, it's that only reprobates will take the mark. And that's why I just would add that in on the end. All right, so in conclusion, so we talked about, so how do these tie into eternal security? It's not possible for believers to commit these sins. Now, is it possible to lose your salvation? No, it's not possible to lose your salvation. That's why it's important we understand it that way. Eternal life is eternal life. You have eternal life and you believe on Jesus Christ. Eternal means eternal. Right? But is it possible to lose your opportunity to be saved prior to death? Yes, it is possible. Right? Now, do we know with certainty who is beyond salvation? I don't think we do. It's a bit like salvation. Only you know and God knows. But you never know with certainty if somebody else is saved. And I'm willing to admit, you do not know with certainty if somebody else is beyond salvation, is reprobate and beyond salvation. Um, but what I think is important to take away from this sermon is death is not always the final chance. Right? People who have not yet believed on Christ, they don't always have till death. So, you know, whether it's somebody that's delaying the decision, you know, so one thing is, you know, people who are delaying the decision to believe on Jesus Christ should not keep delaying. Maybe one day they will not get another chance if they know the truth. And also it tells us, you know, that because people may lose their chance to ever be saved, we don't want to get into the mindset that, like, oh, well, they're young, they've got plenty of time. That's not necessarily the case. So it might push us as well to be, try and be more persuasive, try and be, you know, more committed to convince people because it's not death. Is the only end. There, there are ways to become reprobate prior to that. Anyways, I hope that was an interesting sermon. You learned something. I tell you. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for um, your word. Uh, Lord, thank you that you give us this urgency to preach the gospel. And uh, Lord, I, I, we know that you're a just God. And Lord, we, we know that you know you're not infinitely, you know, giving everyone infinite chances. That one day, you, your patience runs out with people. So I pray, Lord. Um, that you know you would uh, protect us from these evil people that lord you would help us to, to love people and be urgent about giving people the gospel and preaching them the word of god so we thank you lord and we thank you for your word this morning we pray in jesus name amen